Um, as Veronica said, yes, I, I'm, I'm going to focus really on what, just for 15 minutes, a fairly short talk, on what New Zealand scientists are doing at the moment, what's one of our key research projects that uh, the community is undertaking. And I'm focusing in on the Ross Ice Shelf, and uh, we've heard about ice sheets, and I'm going to concentrate on ice shelves, which are already floating. Um, and uh, Jonathan has given us a very good introduction to some of the terms I'll, I'll be using. Veronica mentioned SCAR, the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research, so I just thought very briefly I'll just put um, some of this in the context of that international community and, and the New Zealand research, Antarctic researchers work very much within that international um, Antarctic community. And a couple of years ago in Queenstown, actually, New Zealand, we, we, we brought together the international experts in Antarctic research and scanned the horizon, looked for what are the big questions over the next 15, um, 20 years in Antarctic research, and, and obviously sea level rise, um, what's happening to the ice sheets, are they losing mass, um, are they gaining mass, uh, the very things that Jonathan's been talking about uh, came sort of top of the list, including the southern ocean and sea ice. So there's three sort of questions there. I won't go through them, but the first one is about sea ice. Why is it changing? How is it changing? What's happening around the Antarctic? The second one is about ice sheets, and we already know from Jonathan's talk how important uh, that is in terms of sea level rise and in terms of influencing New Zealand. And the third one is the one I'll talk a little bit about, is about ice shelves. How stable are the ice shelves around Antarctica? How vulnerable are they? How long is this big ice shelf that I'm going to talk about, the Ross Ice Shelf, um, going to remain in place? And that's um, incredibly important in terms of um, the contributions coming from Antarctica to sea level rise. So firstly, just one slide on, on sea ice trends, because it's something one often picks up in, in the media. Um, we know already, Jonathan's told us, about sea ice um, disappearing around the Arctic regions. Well, sea ice, as you see in the top graph there, is actually increasing um, in, in Antarctica, and that's often used, oh, Antarctica's uh, cooling, you know, um, sea ice is increasing, there's, there's, there's the evidence. But um, really what's actually happening is sea ice has been redistributed around, around Antarctica. Um, sea ice is, is disappearing from, or it's lessening in some places and increasing as shown in red in, in two places. So the distribution is different. And again, it's really important that we understand that, that distribution and, and what's controlling it. So it's quite a bit of the New Zealand's um, Antarctic research is clearly focused in this area. Um, Scott Base is on Ross Island here. Um, this is the Ross Ice Shelf that I will be talking about later on. Um, uh, which is floating, and this is the, the sea ice um, surrounding Antarctica. So it's getting an understanding of, of why this is happening and how important sea ice is within that global system. And this fits in very nicely, actually, with the National Science Challenge, the Deep South, and this is one component of that National Science Challenge um, that um, relies on Antarctic research around uh, what's happening with sea ice. But it, I'll also point out it's not just the distribution of sea ice that's, um, that's important, it's actually the thickness as well. Um, one of the programs we've got is uh, developing techniques to measure the thickness and change in thickness of um, Antarctic sea ice um, through time. So that's just one area of, of research that's very active um, in New Zealand Antarctic research. I also want to just step back and, and, and show these two diagrams about how Antarctica is actually warming at the, at the present time. And it's warming um, in a very uneven fashion. And, it, and you know, one can use statistics in different way. And this, looking at data from 81 to 2004, we get, just as Jonathan has said, this is the global hotspot. The Antarctic Peninsula is warming more rapidly than any other place on the, on the planet. Um, and this is West Antarctica, where we've talked about the West Antarctic ice sheet that's, that's warming. This is a, taking data of a longer record, again showing how West Antarctica is warming, um, perhaps a slight change over East Antarctica, um, and a slight cooling shown in this, in this diagram here. And actually, it's also, I think, important to understand that the main 
as scientists believe the main control on the climatic conditions around Antarctica is actually the hole in the ozone layer at the present time rather than greenhouse gas um, warming. And of course, what's going to happen in the future is the ozone hole is, is closing up over a 50-year time period, we hope. And we're going to see global warming related to greenhouse gases kicking in and this pattern changing, and probably an increase in warming in Antarctica um, halfway through this, this century. So I think it's important to sort of understand that in terms of what's, what's really happening in, in Antarctica. But from our perspective at the moment, this is the area that's warming. Um, and, and this is our interest here down on the, um, on the Ross Ice Shelf. So just looking at the Antarctic Peninsula, um, which is the global hotspot where warming has temperatures been rising over a 50-year period, known from the instrumental record, well, what's happened? The ice shelves, the floating ice shelves, have disintegrated, eight or ten of them over a 25, 30-year period um, shown in, in this diagram. So, being floating ice shelves, as I say, they're already floating, they're not contributing to sea level rise, but they act as a, as a stopper, as a buttress to ice on the, on the land. Um, and as soon as you remove an ice shelf, the ice flows eight to ten times faster off Antarctica into the, into the ocean and then melts and, and raises sea level. So they're incredibly significant in terms of, of, of global warming. Um, we're very fortunate in that there isn't um, a large mass, a large volume of land ice on the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so it's a small contribution, but these glaciers are all speeding up uh, as soon as the ice shelf um, is, is removed. Um, this shows the well-known collapse of the Larsen A and Larsen B ice shelves in, in the 1990s and early two, 2000s. But what these corresponded with um, some of the warmest years on record on the Antarctic Peninsula um, and included um, melting and water forming on, on the ice shelves that led us to believe really it was a sort of a top-down approach. It was the atmospheric changes that were, caught, that were forcing the collapse of these uh, ice, ice shelves. It was probably um, our view in those days. And, and this diagram shows uh, an isotherm, the minus 5 and minus 9 isotherm here. And there was a feeling that it was that if, if the Antarctic Peninsula warmed more than minus 9 degrees, then um, the, as an average temperature, then the ice shelves collapsed. Um, so it was very much a sort of top-down forcing from, from atmospheric, from temperature change. We now know, and Jonathan has told us about this, that the oceans are really, really important. So it's not just a top-down, it's very much a, a bottom-up uh, control uh, forcing on the stability of the ice, of the ice shelves. But irrespective of the control, uh, ice shelves are very sensitive indicators of change. Um, within the Antarctic environment. He's talked about the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and how important, how potentially unstable it is into the future. And it's unstable because it's a marine ice sheet. And that, that means it's sitting on land that's below sea level. So that's extremely important in terms of the stability or instability of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. What's Equally, if not more important, is the fact that the deep areas of, um, of, of the, this uh, basin is actually in the interior part of West Antarctica, um, up to two, two to three kilometers below sea level. So the, the land beneath the, uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet s slopes in towards the center of West Antarctica, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. And that's extremely important in terms of how stable, how long this West Antarctic ice sheet um, will, will last. Um, and here we are just focusing in on the West Antarctic ice sheet. We can divide it up into these three parts, and we're extremely lucky that there are two major ice shelves, the Ross Ice Shelf and the Ronnie Ice Shelf, buttressing or holding in the West Antarctic Ice Sheet at the present time. One third of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet 
is rapidly flowing out through this area here. It's, so this portion is currently unstable and contributing to, to sea level rise. But the big question is, how stable is this Ross Ice Shelf and this Ross Ice Shelf here? And this is the big focus of a new um, Antarctic um, research program uh, focused in on the, Ross, on the Ross Ice Shelf. So here it is. Um, it's, um, the title of the program is, is up there, but it basically is how vulnerable is the Ross Ice Shelf in a, in a warming world? How long is it going to last? 50 years, 100 years, or, or whatever, because it's acting as the buttress, um, preventing the West Antarctic ice sheet from flowing out into and melting into the sea. We will, it's pretty stable at the present time. It's a multi-group. You see the different um, institutes involved in, in New Zealand. It's a very major program, partly funded by the New Zealand Antarctic Research Institute with contributions from the Marsden Fund and from the Ministry of Business, um, Innovation and, and Employment, with many different institutes involved. It's led by Christina Halber from Otago um, University. It's a three to four year, year program. We're one year into it at the present time. Here is the, here's Ross Island with Scott Base on it. Here's the Ross Ice Shelf, which, which is floating. Um, well, I'll show you, it's, it's very thick. Um, we plan to drill two holes down through it, um, labeled here, hot water drill site two and hot water drill, drill site one. And the scale shows the depth of water beneath this floating ice shelf. So this is the focus um, of our program. This is a cross section through the ice, the Ross Ice Shelf. We're interested in four boundaries. So the first is, is the surface boundary here, and that involves the atmospheric conditions. Um, is it going to snow more? Are we going to get more precipitation? Are we going to get a buildup of ice on the surface? Secondly, it's the carving from the ice front. What are the processes going on, on there? Thirdly, <laughs> it is this, this bottom-up influence, which we now think is the major influence on the stability or instability of the ice shelf. And it's the warmer, warmer waters, layers of the ocean coming in underneath the ice shelf, melting, refreezing, and eroding the ice shelf from underneath that is probably the biggest threat to the Ross Ice Shelf. Then there's the grounding line zone here, which is where the ice shelf is pinned to the underlying bedrock. And it's, this is a very important zone in terms of how, what's the substrate, how much water's underneath, um, what, how, how fast is the, uh, is, the grounding, is the ice moving across this grounding line. And this is where I, I alluded to the point about the, the, the rock surface sloping back to the interior of the continent. So it's quite likely the grounding zone will get stuck on promontories on the ocean floor. And then it'll reach a critical point where it will retreat back um, in the reverse slope towards the center and, and become very unstable and, 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 and melt rather quickly. So this zone is incredibly important. Hence, this hot water drill system, drill hole, comes down towards the, the grounding zone. Um, this is the other hole. Um, these holes will be about 25 to 30 centimeters. We're developing lots of exciting technology to put down these holes. Um, we'll have an observing system um, on the base of the ice shelf. So can you imagine? It's really exciting that we'll be able to measure the temperature, the salinity, the, at the ocean uh, currents, put cameras down, see if there's any um, animal life in, in the underneath, in the water underneath the ice shelf, uh, putting a seismograph as well. So one of the so this this will be a fantastic observing system once we get this hole drilled and get our instruments down. There's it, even in conjunction with the U.S., we may be putting an automatic um, uh, vehicle down to um, motor around the water column here. It's called Skinny. Obviously, it has to be thin to go down through a 25, 30 centimeter hole. So there's lots of exciting uh, technology to be developed 
um, around, um, around this, this program. We will also attempt to drill down into the sediments underneath the ice shelf, and this will allow us to see where this grounding zone has been in the past. It's obviously um, in a colder world, the ice, West Antarctic ice sheet was more advanced, it's retreated back to this position, and we intend to drill down through these holes into the substrate um, and below. So we've had one season. I'll just briefly show you some of the work that we've, we've already done, um, including um, using a radar to measure the thickness of the ice shelf, which is three to four, five hundred meters thick in, in different places, so we can get reflectors off the base of the ice shelf. Uh, letting, letting us know how thick the ice shelf is. But this radar is in place at the moment and it's measuring as, as we speak, so we'll be able to see how the ice shelf changes in thickness um, over a 12-month period when we go back again um, next, next season. We can also use radar to measure the snow layers on the surface, and this is seeing what the precipitation is, how fast the ice is building up on the surface, because the balance is you know, what we're adding on the top and removing on the bottom. So it's that balance um, through time that we're really, really interested in. And another way of looking at that balance is, one, using radar, but two, uh, drilling shallow holes just down to about 20 meters. Um, and actually mapping the layers, the annual amount of snow that has fallen. And what we've already discovered is that um, the accumulation is actually 15% higher than we expected um, across this particular part um, of the ice shelf. Um, and setting up weather stations to actually monitor what the weather conditions are and see how that current weather relates to the accumulation of snow um, on the surface of the, Ross, of the Ross ice shelf. So these weather stations are in place, um, measuring conditions again um, as we speak. The key to drilling the holes is, the, again, the technology development around a hot water drill. And this has been developed by um, Alex Pine at the University of Wellington, at Victoria University of Wellington. It's based on a drill that the British Antarctic Survey have used for, for many years. So um, this is a big job. Uh, it should be ready this coming season. We're going to drill a trial hole on the McMurdo ice shelf, and then the following season move it to uh, hot water drill site two uh, to, get, um, to, to complete the drilling. So this is, obviously, we need to transport this with small aircraft and uh, make sure it's modular and can be reassembled in the field and, um, and uh, complete the drilling. So yeah, so that's, that's really, that's a summary of this Ross Ice Shelf project. It's very exciting and involves a, involves a lot of people. But the science question is, you know, how stable is that ice shelf? How long is it going to last? Um, at the moment, it's keeping a good part of the West Antarctic ice sheet in place. As soon as that ice shelf disappears, then we're going to see ice streaming off, off the continent. Requires just acknowledge the logistic support. It's a major um, um, program involving a lot of logistical support from Antarctica and New Zealand. So I acknowledge that. And acknowledge all the people um, from the different institutions involved um, and our funding. There's about 20 different scientists involved. You'll see some big cameras here. The National Geographic were part of um, last season's team. So they're producing some programs that we hope will be screened within the next um, 18 months or so on, on TV as part of our our education and outreach.